Hi, and welcome everybody um, to our afternoon seminar. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. My name's Ruth Nichols, and I'm one of the um, members of the AES committee, local Canberra committee. Um, and today we're really pleased to be able to welcome um, one of our committee members, as uh, uh, Scott Bailey to give us a presentation on why programs fail. Um, before we get into the presentation this afternoon, just a couple of housekeeping things. So first of all, I think most of you are on mute um, already. And if you're not, if you could please put yourself on mute. Um, we will have opportunities to have some um, discussion as we go through the seminar today. And that'll be a point at which um, you can come off mute. You can also, if you'd like to um, put some questions in chat as we go along. And when we get to those points of um, having our discussion, um, we'll be um, having a look at what's what's come up in the chat box and use that as an opportunity to, um, to support our learning. So um, the other thing I wanted to let you all know is that our session is being recorded today. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, the AES has a YouTube channel where um, we publish uh, recordings and seminars. So I think without further ado, I'd like to welcome Scott Bailey um, for his presentation. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ruth, and hello, everyone. I'm doing double duty here, trying to admit people into the session while I'm paying attention to what I'm going to say. So anyway, we'll work it out. I want to talk today about the symptoms and causes of underperformance in government programs and what that might mean. And I'm waiting for this PowerPoint slide to move forward. There we go. So I, I want to have a little bit of discussion about examples of failure, and I'm going to share some of mine, and I'm going to ask if you'll be willing to share some of yours. I'm going to talk about the common symptoms of program underperformance, what they might mean, what the main causes of underperformance might be in government programs, the four reasons why an impact evaluation might conclude that a program is ineffective. And then if we have any time left, I'll talk a bit about key challenges for evaluators in assessing social programs. And I'm just going to pause for a sec and let some people in. Thanks for doing that, Scott. OK. This is very slow, this internet. So here's some examples from my own experience about um, different cases of underperformance. I won't give the exact details of who the agency is to protect the, the guilty, so to speak, but these are all real world examples. Myself and some others did a study on uh, mental health services for people in crisis, and we pulled 900 patient files. And each of those files was meant to have a, a plan for the patient, the client. And we only found about 40% of them did have a plan that was required. Now, the department would say, well, everyone had a plan. We just didn't put them on the file. That may or may not have been true. I never really knew. But one thing was for certain, their quality control certainly fell down. That's without doubt. Another piece I did at work once somewhere else was looking at uh, services to child protection allegations. And these would get prioritized for high, medium, and low. And what we found was over a 12 month period, only 30% of the high priority allegations got a response within the department's own timeframes. So that's a lot of kids who didn't get investigated who were notionally at high risk. Another example of mine was I looked at a national grants program. And as part of this grants process, a community agency would get a grant, They'd spend the money, and then they were supposed to have an audit report, report back to the funder, and then the grant would be acquitted, that is to say, signed off. What we found over a three-year period, only about 50% of these grants were actually ever acquitted. And this was a program worth hundreds of millions of dollars every year. 
So those are sort of illustrative examples from my own experience. I was wondering though, if people would be willing to share some examples from their own experience of what looked like underperformance in a government program. I'd invite you not to, to identify who the agency or the clients were, but just give a, a rough flavor of what was the nature of this underperformance. Would anyone like to offer an example or two? I know it can be tricky sometimes to think of examples, can't it? But I can see a hand from Harry. So go for it, Harry. G'day, um, Scott and Ruth, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Great. you. Yep. Um, so look, just to get things kicked off, I can talk about one that we've published. So um, we're not too embarrassed about it. We um, worked on an app to support university students who might get discouraged early in their studies to try to stick it out at university. Uh, it was something we did uh, with funding from Department of Social Service as part of their Try, Test and Learn <coughs> fund. And um, we spent a lot of time on um, developing the, the app. This was um, uh, Beta, the behavioural economics team based in Prime Minister and Cabinet. Spent a lot of time um, developing the, the app, thinking a lot about uh, what would help um, students. We did a lot of user testing um, and we um, uh, did a you know, pilot rollout, then did the, the eventual rollout. And um, in terms of student retention, which was our sort of the main thing we we're looking at, um, we didn't see any uh, improvement. Um, and we also wanted to have a look at grades and we couldn't see much improvement there either. Um, and uh, it looked like, although we'd spent a lot of effort in trying to make the app sticky so that people would um, keep using it um, after they'd initially signed up, that uh, a lot of the problem was that there was a, a big drop off in usage after the first week or two of downloading the app. Um, so there wasn't much prospect of um, impacting on retention or results if they, um, if they weren't using it much. So that's, um, but that, that, that hurts because there was a lot of time and effort and imagination that was poured into that um, for seemingly little return. That's our example, thanks. Oh, thank you, Harry, that's a great example. Anyone else be willing to share one of theirs? You're welcome to put your hand up if you want to, like Harry did. I know, Scott, um, in my experience doing independent evaluations, I've certainly seen some programs being implemented in a very short period of time and expecting to see impact results, you know, within like, you know, less than a year. And while, you know, the program's still really just trying to get itself organised and, um, yeah, that's been, that's been an interesting um, you know, phenomenon I've seen on a couple of occasions. Um, Kim? Yes, hi. I'm not quite sure how my, um, my camera's going, but hello. Um, Kim Gray here. Um, I was musing over an example that I'm not going to name, and um, I think the big challenge with this one was that there was a big difference between the program's expectations, the settings and the way um, it was supposed to work and what it actually was like and what the participants felt was of value to them. So their experience of the program was not very satisfying and um, therefore data that could have been used to talk about its performance wasn't as informative as it, it was thought to be. So um, I, I'd put that down to a very big difference between the way the policy designers thought the program worked and the way the participants experienced the program. Oh, okay. So we've heard some examples about implementation, about design, but strategies not working. Do you have your hand up, Julie? Yeah, I can't find the little reaction button, so I'm using my little hand. Hey, Scott, I've got one that you might even remember. It's um, affectionately known as the Roads Program, and it um, was about improving governance. So it was, um, you know, it, it's a real issue of how you define success, but basically, or failure, but basically, you know, if you're putting a simple solution to a very complex problem, then it's likely going to fail. And this one I have in mind was um, a sort of an anti-corruption process, and I can't remember the details, of the middle bit, but the, uh, there was, um, if we build roads, 
we will um, improve governance and reduce corruption. And that was not um, a success. I think that would be a failure. Does that ring any bells, Scott? I'm laughing because that's one of my favorite examples, yes. That was never going to work. What a wacky idea, hey? <laughs> that's my best one. Excellent. All right, let's move on a little bit. If the IT will cooperate. Well, I'm having lots of IT problems here. I'm going to talk a bit about symptoms. And some common symptoms include things like quality problems, client complaints, staff turnover, insufficient outputs, wastages, inefficiencies, ineffective programs, programs that aren't responsive to their client group, limited external political support for the program, adverse publicity, inadequate reporting, excessive waiting times, criticisms from, from external watchdogs like parliamentary committees or um, the Auditor General's office, all, all series of things that can happen. And these are important because without the perception that there's a problem, performance improvement has no starting point. That is to say, program managers and public officials need to feel some kind of performance pain. The question is, where does it hurt? And performance pain in public programs can emerge from several interrelated sources, including the inadequate production of goods and services, program just doesn't produce enough, the pro program's goods and, goods and services are of insufficient quality, too many resources are being consumed by the program, the program is ineffective, it fails to fulfill its intended purposes. For example, unemployment for youth isn't being reduced. The issue of client dissatisfaction and complaints. And the mirror image of that, of course, is staff dis dissatisfaction and turnover. Conflicts with other related organizations, coordination problems, that's quite common between federal state agencies. There might be inadequate inadequate adaption or innovation in the program, a failure to respond to changing client ex needs or external circumstances. Performance reporting can be a problem. And I mentioned lack of political support, adverse publicity, criticism from watchdog agencies. But all these problems are actually symptoms of underlying causes. And finding out where it hurts sets the scene for performance improvement, perhaps in three ways. It determines whether there is a perceived need or change to improve performance. It helps to identify the sources of performance pain. And public sector managers also benefit from understanding who cares about a performance problem and who's willing and able to do something about it. Some of these potential underlying causes include the program's mandate. That is to say, the mandate could be unclear, or the program lacks authority, there was a confusion of roles across agencies. There's the issue of strategy. That is to say, the program's theory of change is faulty, or the assumptions are untenable, the strategy does not fit the program's environment. It's another common one. Or perhaps structure. That is to say, the program's structure does not fit its environment or its strategy. There's inconsistencies of tension. One of my favorites is the topic of performance leadership. That is to say, the leadership style is incongruent with the program, or there is inadequate governance, accountability, or an, uh, a limited focus on using performance feedback to drive continuous improvement. Culture can be an issue if the culture and incentives do not support a focus on continuous improvement and achieving results. The organization systems can be an issue in terms of policies, systems, and processes failing to support effective program management and service delivery. And finally, the topic of resources. If the level of resources, financial, physical, people, technology, and operational capacity is inappropriate for the program's design and systems. So what I'm trying to do is argue 
that we have some very common symptoms that most of us have bumped into at one time or another, but these symptoms are actually symptoms of underlying causes that are more fundamental drivers of the problem. So I'd be interested in hearing from yourselves at this point, how does my list of symptoms and underlying causes fit with your own experience? Does this make sense? Does it seem logical? Is it something you've observed in your employment? What's your reaction to this? Scott, it's Peter Graves here. If I can't quite put up my hand, if you can hear me. Yes, Peter, thank you. I'd like to support you particularly on the lack of political support. And I think of why government programs do fail and also their reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of my comments are quite relevant to what's going on with the current government bringing back program evaluation. Um, because I always thought about climate change that Prime Minister Rudd thought was the greatest challenge of our time. We had a climate change department formed in 2000 and whatever, seven, and it all fell in a heap when the Prime Minister changed and Prime Minister Abbott thought that climate change was uh, crap. So having senior leadership that is actually continuous is extremely important. And in that regard, um, some of my recent research about the management reform of managing for results, it never went on long enough. While it went on for 13 years, mm -hmm. it stopped because the support at the top changed and it is now being brought back. So, so there... There is, a time, there is a fact of extended time in a lot of what you're also talking about. So, Peter, this lack of political support, is there a, perhaps that relates in some way to changing governments from one political party to another? Um, no, I think it also involves changes of ministers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of Martin Bowles when he was head of immigration, trying to bring in an, an evaluation culture there. And he brought in Wendy Southern at a very senior deputy secretary level. He moved over to health and brought Wendy with him to bring in a similar evaluation culture. And when he had a falling out with the health minister of the time and left, so did all of those attempts at bringing in an evaluation culture in health uh, fell over because there wasn't one to begin with. So yes, unfortunately, very senior people literally have too much influence on the value of APS programs. I've certainly observed an emphasis on evaluation wax and wane in the Commonwealth over the years. Also and in the shorter term, depending upon the emphasis of the leadership team of a particular department. Um, without mentioning particular departments, I can think of three or four that have either focused on evaluation, secretary change, and then it went off the boil, or the exact opposite has happened. And it sometimes disturbs me that our focus on managing for results depends upon the personalities at the top, and that it's not more syst systemically grounded in our systems and practices. That's just my issue a little bit. Would anyone else like to offer some comments on my list of symptoms and causes and their own experience? Scott, I just want to let you know we've got a comment from Lou who doesn't have a microphone. Um, and Lou says, we've experienced a range of these with the programs we oversee. A lack of consideration of evaluation in the establishment phase has been very pro problematic for us. Yes, I can think of a number of programs that were established, run for a number of years, funded, um, no baseline data collected, no m and &E frameworks put in place. And then I can think of some that were 15 years into the running. They went, oh, maybe we should do an evaluation of this to see how we're going. <laughs> it intrigues me how things can go on for that long. <laughs> yes, Julie. 
It's good. I'm wondering about under what circumstances is a problem amenable to a solution that's called a program, so a programmatic solution, if, um, if you like that. Um, because maybe it's not, it's unrealistic to think that programs can uh, address or ameliorate, ameliorate all sorts of social circumstances that are less than desirable. And so programs overreach what they're really capable of doing in the real world, where um, in government, the real world is that there's an election cycle, that there's ministers mm -hmm. come and go, that they each have their favourite priorities, that um, secretaries come and go, and they each have their own biases and prejudices, because that's how people work. Mm -hmm. So um, what are the limits to what a pro programmatic solutions are capable I'm, I'm of? I'm attracted to your idea um, in a couple of different ways. So on the one hand, I think it's fair to say we've got some great examples of important policy success. Um, the reduction of teenage smoking in Australia, I think that's nothing short of amazing what's been accomplished. But then I could probably try and think of another two, couple of examples where, all right, the Australian aid program in Papua New Guinea with uh, investments designed to reduce corruption. I think, gee, that's a real stretch. We have small sums of money. What's our political influence? What's our understanding of the country? What's our linkage with key decision makers? Our ability to influence incentives in Papua New Guinea officials? That, that whole area makes me think that's a huge stretch on our part. But I'd be interested in other people's views. Uh, Scott, it's Peter Gray's again, just uh, supporting you on that PNG comment. Um, someone who was in a place to know told me that the PNG people don't work out the results of their own programs when governments change because the new government doesn't have an incentive to know the results of what the previous government achieved mm -hmm. and it's all a different course of events. And thinking closer to home, I think the topic of youth unemployment has been a thorn in government side for, oh, Lord, at least since the 1980s that I can think that far back. What do other people think? Kathy. Hi. Um, so I used to work in Jobs Victoria in the Victorian government, and it's quite interesting how you pointed out youth unemployment was... Um, like a, a challenge as well. And I remember us trying to set our goals at the initial program design as well too. And it you can set those goals, but it's also like there's other factors that might call, there might, might be other social, um, it, it, it comes to, it, it's kind of similar to like that wicked policy problem where you might define a, um, the per, like the problem and be able to identify the goals in the initial program phase. But when you actually work and have to implement you're dealing with other complex challenges as well. Um, so that's where evaluation can be quite challenging when you're um, working towards implementing that program, but then other programs, uh, like other problems arise as well. Hmm. Thank you, that's a good point. Other comments or observations? Hi, Scott, Kim here. Yes, I'm, um, I'm musing over, hi Scott, yes, I'm musing over the, uh, the slide you have up with symptoms and causes and, um, and I like the way you've talked about needing to feel pain, need to actually have a reason to explore something, so some signs that there's a problem and they're the symptoms but they're not the cause and then you've got a smaller list of causes. So I just wondered what you'd say about the relationship between symptoms and causes. Do you see any relationship or is this a much more complex um, question? Yeah, I've, I've mulled that one over and I think it's fantastically complicated and probably context dependent. Um, for example, the a particular symptom could be related to one or more different causes. Uh, pick something, staff dissatisfaction turnover. Maybe that's because they're overworked. That is to say, there's, they have inadequate resources. So maybe that's why they're dissatisfied in their turnover. Or maybe 
they feel like they don't have the mandate, the authority to do their work. And so they're being held accountable for things outside of their control. And that's the source of their dissatisfaction and turnover. Or maybe they are unhappy with the leadership of the agency, and that's the source of their dissatisfaction turnover. So I can't imagine there's a direct necessarily one-to-one -one correlation between, oh, this symptom is always related to these causes. I would think it's perhaps more in a diagnostic sense, well, I've got these cluster of symptoms, and now I'm going to have to try and work backwards to try and identify what the underlying cause is. But I'd be interested in your thoughts, but my initial reaction is not going to be a straight one-to-one -one relationship. Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure that's the case. Sorry, I was just uh, responding briefly. I'm sure that's the case, Scott, and, um, and I would sort of also argue that you need to explore more than the symptoms that you've been able to observe. Um, I think there's a lot more to unpacking the causal drivers than what you can necessarily observe. Um, there may be things that you have, you need to do more research into something to understand what could be going on. So um, I think looking for symptoms is a great way of thinking about what you're doing when you're linking monitoring data and monitoring indicators through to unpacking an evaluative question. Mm. It, it, I thought that was quite a nice way to um, to think about what you're offering here, that um, finding out where it hurts is a question more like monitoring. Does it hurt anywhere? Let's just check in. Hurting. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going well. You may not just, you just may not have enough information yet. Yeah. And um, I had the, the poor judgment once to apply some diagnostic work to a, a symptoms in an organization I was working in that I won't name, but we had some real quality problems. And so I did some five whys analysis on the quality problem. And I also did a problem tree analysis. And that raised some very sensitive issues very quickly. And uh, it wasn't received real well in the senior management, sort of the SES band two level and upwards. And I guess I was pointing at things that were A, incredibly problematic, B, not necessarily amenable to easy problem solving, and C, didn't help particular individuals and their reputations. And so whilst I thought my work was reasonably insightful, it didn't go anywhere because politically there was no support for it. And so that was one of my comments a moment ago. It's one thing to identify symptoms, but another is who's interested in this symptom? Who's willing to work on it? Who cares about this issue? And I think those are perhaps the, the really important diagnostic questions rather than a more mechanical, the symptoms might be a reflection of that cause. That's just an initial reaction by me. Scott, yes, I just wanted to mention that Raoul had um, posted a couple of observations in the chat box as well. Oh, I'm not you. sure if you've seen those. Um, but he raises oh. the idea about the brain drain to the public sector, impairing public sector capability on various fronts. Yes, it's um, interesting that our current government um, has spoken about the need to rebuild public sector capacity. Um, and that was something raised in the authority review of 2018. And then the uh, commission of audit, and I've forgotten what year that was, 2012 maybe, raised this issue about public sector capacity. I, I agree that it's an issue, but I honestly don't know, at least at the Commonwealth level, what the government's going to do about that in such a tight, tight budget environment. Um, because, one of the things governments are conscious of is the number of public sector FTEs positions and the associated salary budget. There's actually incentives for Commonwealth governments to employ consultants because it treats they're treated differently on the balance sheet. And so it's been an issue for a number of governments. They can say, well, the total number of public servants has been flat in the Commonwealth for the last number of years, and that's almost a point of pride while they spend more and money, more money on consultants. But of course, at the same time, the capacity has been and um, capacity is being outsourced as well as corporate knowledge is that being outsourced. So yeah, Rural makes a great point, but I honestly don't know what the solution to that is, especially in a really tight budget environment. But having said that, 
maybe I'll contradict myself. This was the like, argument that uh, Bob Hawke, Paul Keating used in 1986 when the budget was a bit tight. And they said, you know what? We've got to do better at spending our money where it counts. And they pushed evaluation policies and made it mandatory. And Paul Keating was trying to identify programs that worked and didn't work. And those that didn't work either had to be fixed or they'd be canceled or wound back. And that way he could generate additional money to spend on other programs that work better, which makes a great sense. And personally, I'm really supportive of that. There was only one problem though. They got the incentives a bit messed up. And so programs realized fairly quickly if they did an impact evaluation of their own program and they criticized that next time around, they got a budget cut. So it only took one and a half rounds of that before every department did a self-evaluation that said, hey, we're great, everything's good. So the incentives got distorted and other countries or Chile's an example, those big major impact evaluations aren't under the department's own control, the equivalent of prime minister and cabinet leads them. So, so they let line agencies do implementation studies, but the big strategic policy, high visibility impact evaluations are, are actually managed by prime minister's office, usually done by consultants. Other comments or questions? Scott, if I could come in on that again, bringing in an international example that is ahead of Australia, and it is in America, through a piece of law actually signed by Donald Trump, the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policy Act, black letter law in America, requires every agency to have a chief evaluation officer and to have an annual evaluation plan. That is a good start. What happens to the reports afterwards is a separate issue, but in America, it is now mandatory, obligatory, and legally required to do program evaluation. Yes, the um, AES input into the Thoughty Review recommended the, that all departments had a chief evaluation officer, chief performance officer, equivalent to finance and HR, trying to mm. locate responsibility for that function. Not sure there's a much support for that, although we do have the evaluator general sort of argument that's been topical for the last couple of years here, but I'm not fully sure how that's going to play out in our space just yet. Julie's there. Julie's there. <laughs> Hi, Scott. I'm just wondering if um, where you would include sort of like a lack of um, stakeholder involvement in, in the framing of the... Um, the the situation of interest if that would be a, a an early symptom if they weren't involved in defining uh in framing the the situation of interest and defining you know what success and failure looks like oh i think you might be a pre-symptom or do you have another word for that well i think that's certainly a, an issue whether it's a symptom or a cause i'm not sure off the top of my head but i think you raise a brilliant issue and that makes me think of, it's old school, but I've always liked Joe Holy's five steps to program management. He was the chief evaluator in the federal US health department some years ago. And he'd say, step one, engage with your stakeholders and try and develop a consensus about what the problem is and what needs to be achieved. Step two, design programs that potentially might work to address this problem. Step three, you, you implement this program while you evaluate it from a whole range of different value perspectives. Step four was to use your performance feedback to drive continuous improvement. And step five was to communicate back to your stakeholders, your funders, government, and the public about what you've achieved. And that was his idea of what the continuous improvement cycle was. Certainly in my work in government, I used to see examples of step one, develop a consensus of stakeholders about what the problem is and what a good outcome looked like. That always would come back to bite you. If you don't get that right up front, and I understand why sometimes we don't, because there's pressure to act, and I get that, and spend money and be seen to be doing things for political reasons. But that is a problem never goes away. If you don't sort it out, eventually, whether it's five, 10, 20 years, it will come back to you again. 
And I see Kim holding up her hand. Yes, Kim. Yes, thanks. I was thinking maybe this um, idea of a lack of stakeholders involved at the start. It's something that we see in uh, work in Indigenous affairs where we're thinking about are the right people involved? We're thinking a lot harder about that now that the Closing the Gap Partnership is requiring more work on engagement and partnership. So I would, I would argue maybe that um, it's a risk indicator rather than a symptom. Ah. So maybe there's a set of risk indicators that could be correlated with signs of potential program failure. I hadn't thought about it that like it that before, but I kind of like your idea. I think that's there's something good in that. Yes, Julie. I just found my hand to raise, so <laughs> thanks. Um, but I was going to say that's an interesting idea, Kim. Risk indicators, um, signs that something's wrong, and I think that might might um, kind of help us decide what is amenable to a program solution and what needs much more systemic change. Um, uh, some of the um, issues that might, might um, come up as program failures were always going to be fa failure as a program because they're long-term. And as you said, Scott, they're always going to pop up later on. We might sign this, kind of squash them down. But yeah. if the systemic conditions that are actually holding them in place are still there, then um, nothing really is fundamentally going to change. Um, Thank you. Other comments, observations, experiences you're willing to share? Uh, Kim here, I, I, is that you, Ruth? Yeah, I was just going to say, Scott, there was a, a there was a comment from Lou. I just want to acknowledge um, Lou had put, put in there about um, uh, the section being established through an NPP specifically, um, and that was to enhance governance, uh, program governance, conduct evaluations and develop internal capability. Interesting trifecta there. It does intrigue me that um not all new policy proposals will have a budget allocation for evaluation, for example. That would seem to be a, a fundamental precondition for setting yourself up to, you know, for tracking how you're going as you go along. Yes, Julie. Well, Scott, you're assuming that that that's the intention to have success and change something. The intention might be just to be seen to be doing something. Uh, don't, yes. don't pretend to be naive here, Scott. <laughs> oh, I'm laughing because you're quite right. And uh, what's his name? Do, um, Duncan Fraser wrote about a series of articles in the evaluation uh, news and comments back in the, oh, Lord, 19, early 1990s, I think it was. And he argued that programs were of different types. And one type was a I'm here to solve a problem type. There was another one that was, I'm just here to give the illusion that we're doing something uh, because it's basically uncontrollable. Um, I've forgotten what a couple, you had a couple more types and I just can't remember what they are off the top of my head. But yeah, some were functional problem solving programs and others were more political and symbolic in their intentions. So yeah, you make a good point. Another one I just thought of, it could be that I'm just biding time until I come up with the solution, you know? Oh, yeah, a whole kind of a mix response. of the first two that you suggested. Yeah. But I'm sure that would be a really fun thing to do to write that list, that full list. Ah, and another one of his I've just remembered is to divert resources towards your political supporters. It wasn't that we're actually trying to solve very much, but we're diverting grant funds towards an area of the economy where we like those people. So we'll make sure that they get a, a bit of yeah, cherries. That resonates. <laughs> Never seen that one in practice, no. <laughs> Any other comments? Well, if not, I'll move on. IT willing, I'll move on. I'd like to suggest, this is 
related topic, but I'd like to suggest if you employ someone to do an impact evaluation, there are four and only four explanations for why an impact evaluation might conclude that the program is ineffective. And I mean it. To my way of thinking, there's only four. And the first one is strategy. If you're teaching, for, I'll use a silly example, but you'll get the point. If you're teaching farmers to, bin, to burn incense to improve their crop yields and thereby raise their income, well, it doesn't really matter how much incense nor how well they burn it, it's just not gonna work. So sometimes the fundamental strategy is just wrong. And it doesn't matter how much you do it or how well you carry it up, it's just not going to work. So that's one reason your impact evaluation can find your program doesn't work. The second one is your strategy is fine, but you're not actually able to implement it with an integrity. That is to say, the intended services aren't getting to the right people. There was a really amusing evaluation I read some years ago in the US. And um, these people were supposed to go door to door in urban, inner city urban areas in Chicago and teach people how to maintain their homes, basically repair them. The program was funded, it was evaluated, it ran for 10 years. There was only one problem. The, pro the program as designed was never implemented. They never actually did the things the program said they were going to do. The program staff decided the original plan was silly, so they did other things instead. Rather than teach home handyman skills to these inner city residents on how to fix their doors or repair a window, they went into an advocacy mode. And so they taught these people how to be community activists and lobby government officials. So in that sense, I'll come back to you in a sec, Julie. So in that sense, the program as designed was never implemented, although it did get evaluated, interestingly enough. The program and its design and its implementation are quite reasonable, but something in its external environment changed. So what used to work doesn't work anymore. An example I've seen in international development is where um, you have a part, you're partnering with someone, an overseas government to do something in their country. And initially they're highly supportive and Australia's doing certain things and the overseas government's doing complementary things, but then their priorities change and they stop doing their part of the agreement. So what used to work doesn't work anymore. And the fourth reason on my list is that actually the program works just fine. It's the evaluation itself that it's faulty. So when I hear about someone saying an impact evaluation found that the program is ineffective, I'm, in, I'm always looking for these as potential reasons. The strategy is flawed, your implementation doesn't work, something in the environment has changed, or the evaluation itself is wrong. We never like to admit that, but it's a possibility. Julie, you had your hand up a moment ago. Oh, yes, yeah, Scott, just a little comment. I like your four, um, your four ideas around this, but uh, the example that you gave, mm -hmm. I thought um, around people door knocking to help people maintain their homes, I thought that was so blatantly a theory failure or a strategy failure that everybody working on it could see it, and that's why they implemented something else. Well, before I, just my bias perhaps, before I'd argue about strategy hadn't worked, I'd want to know the program was implemented first. It might be sus up front, but I'd still, before I declared a clear strategy failure, I'd want to know something about implementation. But I could think of other examples. Um, oh, let me think. Immunization. We know immunization works. The science of that is well established. We don't have to test that. All we have to figure, be clear about is the implementation. I've seen examples uh, of some overseas countries that I won't name, where um, Australia was delivering drugs for immunizations to community health centers that were never ever implemented. They were never used on children. So in that sense, the strategy of immunization was okay, but implementation, there was a delivery failure. Maybe that's a better example than my silly incense burning one. What has been your experience, everyone? I'd be interested in examples if you think this makes sense or maybe I'm missing something. Scott, we have an example from Lillian in the chat box about timing. 
um, knowing when to conduct the evaluation too early and it may not show much in terms of outcomes. That's certainly my experience too, Lillian, and understanding the complexities of evaluation work, which sounds like it speaks a bit to methods appropriateness too. Yeah, I like that one. It's a great, it's a really good one. Something I like that I do a bit of consulting work with Commonwealth Health. And one thing they do with their program logic models, they talk about short-term outcomes, medium-term outcomes, long-term impact. They make the program areas put time frames on those. So program area X, in what time frame after the delivery of your outputs are you expecting to see these short-term outcomes? Is it one to three years, five to seven, whatever? And the same again for the medium terms and the same again for the long terms. And that can be really helpful, particularly for two reasons. It forces you to think about what the trajectory of outcomes is. And secondly, if you're an evaluator and you see this, it's a way of flagging what expectations are at different points of time. So thank you, Lillian. I think that's a grand idea. Any other comments or observations? Kim here. I'd, um, I'd just back up that comment, um, noting that a lot of the time you see program logical theory of change saying that short term is one year and medium term is up to three years and long term is longer. But um, I really like the way you flag that areas would need to work out what is their expectation, which I'm not sure people can really do very accurately, frankly, but I guess that's better than an arbitrary approach. Yeah, I think you make a great point. Um, I'm not sure we often really do know what the likely trajectory is. Um, but gee, it's a good thing to wrestle with and, and facilitate a, a good discussion about that. But over in the chat, Hannah's um, made some con contributions. Um, Hannah says, I work in the international environment and often see stakeholders in the countries we work in that have variable priorities. These might be determined by their government of the day or other external factors. It can make it interesting managing expectations both when designing and evaluating programs. To add to that, at times stakeholders may not have the high level insights to, to decide what is a priority and why, and this can impact what they tell us. Yes, I agree with all of that. And at the same time, programs are political creations and ideally they should be reflecting just to what extent is possible a bit of a consensus amongst that political process and the stakeholders i mean it, sometimes governments just do things because they have to urgently and they don't have time responding to COVID could be an example but it's not always like that and we certainly have programs that have been running for decades and maybe the community hasn't really had much opportunity to have a say about this program and how it's being implemented or what it's trying to achieve. And maybe they have, but we just have to have the same discussion again. Um, I've got lots of friends who are teachers. I I'm, don't have a background in teaching, but I've got friends who do. And the role of public sector teachers comes up every five years or something, and it has done forever. And I suppose it will continue to do so, the extent to which the public education system has um, responsibility for the narrow instructional aspect of students versus more broader life skills, um, let alone issues like sexuality and this sort of thing. So where their demarcation and responsibilities lie in the public education system seems to be a topic that's open for discussion on every five years or so is my impression. All right, I might move on a little bit. We're on the home stretch here. I'd like to make some comments about the key challenge, challenges for evaluators seeking to assess social programs. And I got a lot of this from a former boss of mine, Pam Williams, oh, back in the around 2000 when we worked together, and also from some of my own experiences in a range of different sectors. And I think there are some common challenges. One of these being, how are you going to decide on the evaluation's area of focus? You know, options include 
the changing nature of government policies over time, funding levels, desired outcomes, strategies in a particular sectoral area, they can change massively. So what are you going to focus on? You want to assess the volume of outputs delivered, service coverage, adequate adequacy of access, things like waiting lists, you can do that. Service quality, sure. The program's impact on stakeholders, where it's the immediate client, their family, the broader community, both intended and unintended effects, interactions with other programs, these are all options. Personally, I think, and I include myself in this, I think we've been very, we've underdone the area of unintended effects. I really don't think we've given that great justice. Although interestingly enough, I was working with a fellow in the ACT government, one of Raul's colleagues, and I won't name the program, but this person developed a negative program theory. That is to say, he had a positive theory how the program would work based on various assumptions. And then he went, what if every one of my assumptions didn't hold and the exact opposite outcome happened? And he developed a negative program theory. I'd never seen one before. I thought it was sheer genius, though, myself. It was a horror story if it all happened, but it was a great thing that he was aware of this. Something else that comes up a lot is the equity of funding allocations across geographic regions or across different client groups. Uh, and it could be performance monitoring, evaluation, and accountability system. These are all topics that an evaluation could potentially focus on. And there's no immediate right or wrong to it, but by gee, there's a whole range of issues there, more than you could possibly hope to cover in one evaluation, which means you're going to have to make choices. That's really the essence of my message. And then there's systemic challenges. Um, how about, I see this a lot, the department hasn't developed a program logic model, a theory of intervention for, about how a program is supposed to work. And any theories of action are really implicit rather than explicit. If you interview people, they can explain it to you and they'll have a rationale, but it's very much in one or two people's minds. And it's never really been codified, which means it hasn't ever really been tested either. A common systemic challenge I see a lot is that the target group cannot be serviced at agreed standards within the current resourcing envelope. And that means the department creates waiting lists, queues. Uh, they unofficially will raise the eligibility requirements or narrow the intended target group. And that's just their way of trying to manage with not enough money to, do, to service everyone in need. There's all this issue too with a free service of having infinite to demand, often not having a clear target to measure against, and demand management, which is sort of government weasel words for demand reduction, becomes management's focus, not meeting demand. That becomes the new unofficial goal. Sometimes we don't have clear measure of successful outcomes or appropriate service division. Like that is to say, we have unclear criteria and standards for service delivery. So you as an evaluator, do you want to open that can of worms, or even potentially suggest some or try and work with your stakeholders to try and develop criteria and then evaluate against that? You could do. We also find that uh, workforce issues are common, staff shortages, the need for training, high turnover, low morale. If you ever worked in a program area where 25% of the staff turned over every year, I have. That means in four years, 100% of your staff have turned over. And that has huge implications for learning corporate memory. You often find too that you can find large amounts of administrative program data are collected, but the data is not very good quality, limited ad hoc analysis undertaken, and what the data actually means, the client files can be incomplete. That's not uncommon. And if you have decentralized service provision coupled with unclear roles and responsibilities between the central office and regional office, that makes some really difficult evaluation work. Um, more and more, we'll see con service delivery being contracted out with perhaps limited contract and quality oversight. And if all that wasn't enough, particularly in areas like health and education, each level of government has limited control, but overlapping roles. Federal government has policy and funding. State has responsibility for ensuring good outcomes. At the same time, you've got alternative service providers are also operating in the sector. So what you find in some of these national sectoral areas like health, education, is that government, government's role often becomes not efficient and effective delivery of a service, but one of 
plugging gaps in available services without creating perverse incentives. That's often what happens in practice. And that has some interesting implications for what that means for doing an evaluation. And then for, if we, all that wasn't enough, I'd raise the issue of methodological problems. Limitations in available data, IT systems often not user-friendly. You can have privacy ethical considerations, trying to identify all the relevant outcomes for a client group. Uh, evaluators often have a need for independent expert advice on substantive matters, for example. Uh, and then that can raise issues with evaluators being accused of second guessing clinical judgments. I've been accused of by judges of trying to interfere in legal matters when I was doing an assessment of their management of deceased estates. Um, I was accused by doctors in emergency departments in one state of trying to second guess their clinical judgments in their services to suicidal youth. And I got around that by um, Australia back then had clinical standards for the treatment in emergency departments of suicidal youth. And so I hired the two doctors who wrote the standards and got them to join my evaluation team. And then I paid them to go to 11 hospitals with me and they pulled patient files and assessed them against the standards that they themselves wrote. And gee, what a difference that made from Scott, you're not one of us, you wouldn't know through to, oh, here's George and Fred who wrote the standards. Come in guys, you want our files? We'll give you anything you want. So there are ways of working around this issue of you don't have the expertise or you're not one of us. There's also this issue of decentralized service provision. The, the practical consequence of that means very time consuming and expensive evaluations of large samples. Do you want a representative samples from 26 different sites around the country? I've read evaluations like that in the health system that gets quite expensive fairly quickly. Or do you want to pick five of the 26 sites and just study them? But then how are you going to generalize from the five back to the 26? Or, or some of the sites sort of typical, and you could try and do a, a typical case qualitative sample, as Michael Patton would say. And then the final issue I would raise is that when service delivery has been contracted out, and that's increasingly common, Evaluators need the authority to examine the contracted operations. That is to say, the authority, the ability to follow the money to see where all that goes. I'm conscious I've been talking a lot and I'd like to stop there. And I've, so I've outlined a whole series of challenges under three headings for evaluators looking to assess social programs. And please, I don't invite you for any comments or suggestions or feel free to disagree or point out something I might have missed. Thank you. And Scott, I just noticed that we're just coming up to the end of our time. So I'm not sure if people might need to go soon, but um, does anyone want to ask any questions of Scott before we wrap up? Or make any comments? It's pretty great here to say thank you, Scott, for such real world comments on the practice of the public service in Australia. Sorry, Harry, I think I talked over you. No, I was just saying thanks to Scott. Enjoyed the seminar. Thanks. Likewise, Scott, um, everyone in the Canberra committee would like to thank you very much for um, presenting for us today. It was such a such an interesting um, seminar. I yeah, really enjoyed being able to hear about the examples, especially the um, uh, the incense sticks. I'll take that one. I'll take that as a note for program design. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone as well for coming and joining us today. And um, we look forward to seeing you again.